Hello, and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is well underway, and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot, and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and a next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, many new city council members, and that's not all that's on the ballot. There's also another very important election happening in the city, specifically in Manhattan, but not for a city government position. There's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney the top prosecutor, the top law enforcement official of New York County, otherwise known as Manhattan. A position of immense power and importance, the office holder makes key decisions that impact the lives of many New Yorkers and millions who don't live in the borough or even in the city. Millions of people who call Manhattan home, work there, or just visit the borough. Decisions of life and death, freedom, incarceration, crime, punishment, and more. This is one of the most high profile and important criminal justice jobs in the country. It's technically a state level position, so there are slightly different election rules at play. For example, there are no term limits for the Manhattan District Attorney. Candidates for the office have different campaign finance rules than for city positions. And although ranked choice voting is starting this year for city government posts in special and primary elections, there is no ranked choice voting at play in the Manhattan District Attorney primary. But the election for Manhattan DA is happening this year at the same time as all of the city government elections with a June primary and a fall general election. Hope you got it all. If not, no worries. But the most important thing is that you're here and the primary is coming and you're getting to know the candidates. So we're pleased to bring you this new series of interviews with the candidates running for Manhattan District Attorney, as well as candidates for other offices, including mayor. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates, learn about their backgrounds and platforms and resumes and where they stand on key issues. And in this case, their vision for becoming Manhattan District Attorney. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. So today's interview, joining me by Zoom is Alvin Bragg, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Alvin, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Ben. I look forward to this conversation today. And I, I, I love the lead in frame. Uh, there's a lot that's going to change in our in our city next year. Uh, it's such an important time, uh, obviously in the world, but particularly in New York. Indeed. And thanks. Thanks for making the time here. So um, people, I didn't give people background on you. I want to let you do that. So introduce yourself. Who are you? Uh, where do you come from? What brings you to this race? Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong Manhattanite. Uh, lived uh, in central Harlem and uh, other parts of Harlem for uh, my entire life. Uh, raised uh, in the 1980s, uh, facing all of the criminal justice system from all perspectives. Uh, raised by a mother who was a career educator and a father who uh, ran homeless shelters. Uh, I love this island uh, and I'm so concerned about our future in so many ways. My first interaction with criminal justice issues was a shootout on my block in Harlem as a, as a youngster. Uh, and then after that, uh, my first kind of person to person interaction was a, a lawless stop by the NYPD when I was on my way to get groceries uh, for my father. Um, a gun put inches from my face, uh, falsely accused of being a drug dealer. Uh, that made a lasting impression on me and started my advocacy. Filed a complaint with a precursor to the Civilian Complaint Review Board uh, and began a career fighting for justice. I was stopped countless times by the NYPD as a teenager, three times at gunpoint. Uh, I also had a gun pointed at me three times by people who were not police officers, uh, and that also was terrifying. Those early experiences, that's why I went to law school and why I've been fighting for the past 20 plus years for safety uh, and civil rights. I started out as a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer then became a federal prosecutor working here in Manhattan in the Southern District of New York. Uh, and then finally went to the New York State Attorney General's office where I was the chief deputy attorney general overseeing uh, a staff of 1200. Uh, and I wanna do continue to do what I've been doing, 
uh, fighting for justice and public safety uh, for all Manhattanites. And I believe that experience, both personal and professional, prepares me well. All right, so a lot I wanna uh, revisit there, but let's start, um, you mentioned overseeing uh, many attorneys uh, in the attorney general office and, and staff. Um, the Manhattan District Attorney Office is a very big office. Uh, it's, it's not running city government like the mayor, but it's, it's one of the biggest uh, other offices in city and state government, well over a thousand employees, 120 plus million dollar annual budget, hundreds of other millions of dollars in forfeiture and settlement funds that you have, uh, you can utilize. Talk a little bit more about your management experience and how you would manage and run the office of Manhattan District Attorney. Thanks, Ben. I mean, this is certainly a management position, right? You, you just described the office. Uh, it's similar in size and in many ways smaller uh, than the New York State Attorney General's office, which I oversaw, right? That the state AG's office is statewide. We have 15 offices um, and, and, and kind of more personnel. So very equipped to come in and to be clear, we need management in the Manhattan DA's office. We need culture change. We need an office uh, that is going to uh, not look at a case involving a sexual assault from the perspective of, can we quote, win this case, but to center the trauma of those who are survivors of sexual assault. We need an office that's gonna focus on real police accountability. And it's gonna do cases that make us safer and not some of the cases that come out of the office now, which aren't about safety. I've done all of that from a management perspective. At the Attorney General's office, I first started uh, as a, overseeing the social justice division, overseeing 100 lawyers focused on civil rights, uh, environmental enforcement, healthcare, and labor. I then uh, was appointed to be a special prosecutor overseeing uh, investigations of, of police conduct that results uh, in a killing. Uh, we started that unit uh, from scratch. That's the kind of reboot that we need in the sex crimes unit in Manhattan. And then ultimately I was, I was appointed to be chief deputy overseeing the whole office. That means overseeing the civil rights and the work I did uh, uh, pushing back against stop and frisk. Uh, but it also means overseeing our police force that we had the attorney general's office. So I, I've done the full range of management that's necessary uh, and I'm able to point to a body of work in both public safety and civil rights uh, to bring that experience uh, to show the, the folks in the DA's office, there's a different way to keep us safe, a better way for real safety and community engagement that, that incorporates fairness and public health perspectives. So when you deliver, uh, if you're elected and you deliver a message to all the attorneys under you, the assistant district attorneys and the, those supervising them, what does that sound like? What are the main charges of that culture change? I think you've got it a little bit already in what you've said, but um, make it a little clearer for people. What does that What does that sound like? What's the What are the principles of of that culture change that you think is needed in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office? And are there specific examples you would cite, um, whether it's crimes you would not seek to prosecute, or whether it's areas you want more rigorous prosecution, um, to make it a little bit more you know concrete for people? Definitely, I'll give you two examples. Uh, day one, kind of addressing uh, the staff that we're going to talk about. It's not going to be about the conviction rates, that's been a traditional way to measure success. It's gonna be about community engagement and, and, and public safety. I'm gonna talk about an incident from this summer where a homeless person called my dad used to run homeless shelters, so it really speaks to me, was arrested on a train allegedly for taking up two seats. That's preposterous. Uh, you know, I've had friends arrested for things like that, family members, for, you know, low level things that have absolutely nothing to do with public safety. He was arrested for that and then he was charged with using his face to assault the police officer's hand. Think about how preposterous that is. The question that I wanna ask the staff is how did that case get written up? And there was a complaint room in the DA's office. How'd that get, it's not, not necessarily that first ADA's, I want that person to use independent judgment, but it's a culture, a culture that person didn't feel comfortable pushing back against the police officer who said we need to bring this case uh, and didn't have a chain of command. So my message on day one is there's new leadership I expect you when someone comes in and says, oh, two seats on the subway and his face was used to assault this police officer's hand to say, we're not bringing that case against the homeless person and go to your supervisor and say, we got to start investigating this police officer. That's the first thing in terms of the kind of cases uh, to, 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 to not bring. Uh, and then I want everyone to think about the people involved, right? I had a, a saying when I was attorney general's office, we hire whole people. So I'm a Sunday school teacher, a Harlem little league coach, and when I look at people, 
I want to think about them holistically. So, so that everyone that comes in front of them, they'll say, oh yes, that's a whole person. So my first hire for that special prosecutor's function investigating police killings, that person was a homicide prosecutor, well-equipped, but he had a master's in social work. So I'm always focusing on people. And then the last thing I'll say is for me, this is very personal, right? So I, I, I have a family that's been incarcerated, been in solitary confinement. You know, I, I have friends uh, who I've gone to sort of represent uh, you know, as a, in, in my role as a criminal defense attorney. And I, I need to hire people who have had those kind of experiences and know the system from that perspective. And for those who don't, they need to hear about it. So I'll be talking about my personal experiences and reminding people, this is a system of laws, yes, but a system that's fundamentally about people. And when you, uh, you know, think about sort of the, the, more specific uh, charges that you would give to your assistant district attorneys. And you mentioned, you know, shifting the way they you sort of think about evaluating them. Can you say more about what that would look like? If, you know, are there metrics? Are you talking about shifting it almost completely away from any numbers driven uh, evaluation so that people, you know, working under you in the district attorney's office aren't so concerned with you know, getting as many uh, plea deals as possible. Uh, what, what would that look like? Yeah, we're going to shift completely away from, you know, convictions and cases processed. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a trial lawyer. I've done some of the most complicated criminal, criminal trials that we have. And so I value that experience and we need to develop people, but we're not going to measure folks success. We're going to measure success by judgment. Did you have the judgment to decline that case that wasn't about public safety? Did you have the judgment to say that police officer said the face assaulted by hand? That's a harder way to assess, but that's how I've done it throughout my career, uh, managing you know lawyers for uh, you know several years now. It's harder. Uh, it's not as crude, if you will. Um, it requires analysis and real management. Let's just say we're going to use data, though. Um, you know, one way we're going to use data is to track racial disparities. I mean, there's a 2015 report by the Vera Institute of Justice, uh, which, you know, crunched a bunch of numbers, led to the conclusion we all know there are racial disparities at every step of the way. But it's very, very great to have the data to look at. I'm going to do that in real time to hold my managers accountable. We cannot have a system where, you know, the white person who's charged with uh, the same conduct as a black person gets a different outcome. Uh, and, and, and the report shows it at every step along the way. So we're going to use numbers for that, but we're going to be much more holistic in our assessments. Are you doing community engagement? Are you using good judgment? Are you always focused on the question, does this case make us safer? That's how we're going to evaluate our work. And are there things you would change about, um, about how plea bargaining happens, about um, you know, the so-called trial penalty? Are, are there things you really want to do sort of in the early stages of the work that comes into the office um, to, to overhaul how the whole process of criminal justice works in Manhattan? Sure. I mean, look, we're going to decline a lot of, a lot, a, a lot of cases on the front end. So the, the footprint's going to be smaller. I mean, the, 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 the number of cases that are being done that have nothing to do, uh, you know, with public safety, you know, untaxed cigarettes, you know, uh, the the standalone resisting arrest case, the disorderly conduct. So we're gonna we're gonna do that on the front end. We're also going to uh, have you know real di you know, divergence programs focused on substance use disorder and mental health. I, I take your question to be: once we get a charged case, what are we gonna do? The trial mm -hmm. tax, it's gone once I'm DA. I mean, I, I've you know I've I've tried cases um, and I've you know produced discovery. I've done this. There's no benefit in, you know, one hiding the ball on discovery and not providing the defense. It's, it's ineffective as a, as a matter of, uh, you know, uh, efficiency uh, and it's wrong. So we're gonna have a model and I'm gonna, you know, show assistant district attorneys sort of how I've been successful doing some of the most complicated cases that actually had to do with public safety um, in a way that was uh, respectful to defense rights uh, and, uh, didn't, you know, didn't, you know, center around, uh, you, know, you know, things that are, you know, unfair, unfair practices. So we're going to, we're going to move away from those. What do you say to, uh, to people who are leery of all the talk in this race and elsewhere about decline to prosecute, not uh, for, you know, being forceful about sort of the, the quote unquote, lower level offenses, things related to, uh, you know, minor crimes, disorder, you know, pe people that are worried about 
you know, how far that discourse is moving. Um, is it is the answer what you're saying about the diversion programs? You 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 still want a lot of these uh, challenges, these problems, these issues that people face, community space to be addressed in some way, or do you think that a lot, you know, just the whole system needs to back off in a big way? Well, let, let me give you an example, right? Because I think I'm saying we need different government responses. So the the homeless person taking up two seats on the train, my late father should should in his agencies, uh, you know, social services should be leading that charge, right? He knows more about homelessness than I ever will, or that a police officer does. Uh, let me give you another example: untaxed cigarettes. So I represent uh, Eric Garner's mother uh, and other police accountability organizers in a case against the city seeking transparency and details. Uh, we know he was alleged to have sold loose cigarettes. He was actually breaking up a fight. But I'll use an example from that space. The senior ranks of the NYP that decided that untaxed cigarettes was a, was a scourge. I've never heard an actual New Yorker complain about that as a top 10 public safety issue. They dedicated resources. They went from corner to corner, rounding up mostly young black men. When I was at the AG's office, you know, we were getting some of the same you know, issues and say, oh, we untaxed cigarettes. Well, let me tell you what we did. We went to the source. We said, oh, UPS and Federal Express, they ship thousands and thousands of untaxed cigarettes. Let's, let's, let, let's hold them accountable. We sued them. We went to trial with one, settled with another. We got more than $100 million back in, in state tax revenue. We solved the problem. We helped the public fisc. No one died, no one was debased. So we just gotta think about how to use government power and which levers to pull and not reflexively go to incarceration. And I've done that, I've done that throughout my career. Let me get to kind of what I think is the second half of your question. We need to talk about what we will do also, right? It's not just what we won't do. I, I'm concerned about the uptick of gun violence, um, you know, particularly in upper Manhattan where I live this summer, we're still at historically low crime rates. But you know, if you're the parent of the one-year-old who was shot, that's cold comfort. I've worked in this space. I've done cases that actually make us safer. And my theory of prosecution is we follow the money and we follow the contraband and we hold the people who are doing the harm and the most culpable accountable. Let me give you one example. When I was a federal prosecutor, I prosecuted the owner of a $30 million business. He was using his business to launder tens of millions of dollars of drug money for a violent enterprise. The enterprise was beheading people. We're talking about serious public harm, right? We built that case, it was hard, it took time, took energy, took know-how, it's one of the most complicated money laundering cases in our country. I did that case and we held that person accountable. We saw the public safety benefits. That's what I'm talking, I mean, that, that's what we have police and law enforcement for, to do those cases and then reap the public safety benefits. That's where we should be investing our time and resources. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, the increase in gun violence. That's where I wanted to, to head next. Um, Read your mind, Ben. 2020 obviously saw a very big spike in both shooting incidents, shooting victims, and murders in the city. What do you think was the was the cause of that? But, but more importantly, if you were district attorney um, right now, let's say, what would you be doing about it? Are there things you think a district attorney can do to prevent gun violence and and what kind of gun violence um you know cases would you try to bring yeah look th this is the I, I think the most sobering issue one of the most sobering issues uh facing us and, and i'm the only candidate in this race i mean I, i've had an ak pointed at my head so i i know what gun violence is i've i've looked into the eyes of a loved one who had his best friend shot and killed uh, and called me uh, and looked into that blank stare. So I, I know this from, from all perspectives. What I would be doing if I were a district attorney right now um, is doing what I did at the AG's office. We, we developed a, a, a portal analyzing uh, guns found at crime scenes and tracing them back to the, to the last lawful sale from a federally licensed firearm dealer. There are folks sitting far away from Manhattan who are flooding us with illegal guns and making lots of money, just like the money laundering case I mentioned. It's the same theory. This database is being underused by law enforcement. We developed it. I would be using it to stem the flow of guns into our city. We literally wrote the book uh, and it's being underused. So that, that, that would be a huge piece. Uh, and then in terms of prevention, uh, we need to be you know, talking to our cure violence folks. Uh, who are doing great jobs preventing people who were 
uh, injustice involved uh, and can relate and can speak to people in a way that police officers cannot and you know have community accountability because ultimately we want to prevent right so I want to stop the guns from getting here uh, and the guns that do get here if there's something that looks like something violent's going to happen I want to have our uh, community interrupters engaged in that those are two key pieces of my of my gun platform how much does prosecution prevent how much does prosecution factor into the picture what what gun crimes are you prosecuting how do you handle you know more of the um and not to put this lightly but you know more of the run-of-the-mill gun possession cases versus solving the shootings yeah look that that's a great question ben because i think a lot of people think that all gun issues are are equal i'll give you a few examples from my own life uh so my brother-in-law was arrested on a gun charge uh it was a schoolyard fight. He was a college student. Four students got into a fight. One of them had a gun. They all were charged with constructive gun possession. That's a very different case from someone who goes and shoots and kills someone, right? That's a case where we need intervention. Uh, literally, he was charged for, incarcerated for, um, you know, a gun that he never touched and didn't know about. That's a bad case. We need, we need, we, we need a different option there. And in fact, he was then tracked into the system and it led to the murder I talked about earlier. So the, the, the making that a, a incarceration response in a case actually escalated and put him on a track that led to more trouble. Um, my dad used to have a gun growing up. You know, I ultimately had him turn it in. It was legal where he came from down south, I believe, but not here. Um, you know, if, if someone came in the house, I finally told him, so dad, you're an older man now. Someone comes in here for a health call. Uh, they're going to arrest you for having that gun. That's ridiculous. Gun hadn't been fired in 60 years. No, you know, so we need to really think on a continuum and a spectrum. But those are yeah. guns that those are guns that sometimes then work their way around communities and neighborhoods and into the wrong hands and get used. Well, no, well, I I would challenge you on that. I mean, the examples I gave, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a then seven year old person with a gun had been in the home since I was last time it pulled out was when I was eight and we thought the home was being burglarized, so no one touched it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the ex other example is a gun that someone might say, oh, that might be used, but we got to tie it to a person. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law was, had never, didn't even know about the gun, wasn't, wasn't aware of it, but yet was charged with constructive sure. yeah. possession. But I hear your point is to, to other folks who are, who are carrying the guns, uh, but I think we need to look at it in a very individualized way. And then on the other extreme, obviously, if you use a gun and you're killing someone, you're shooting someone, well, that's a different case. Yeah, talk about, talk about that a little bit more because, um, you know, I think, I think rightfully, of course, you know, many New Yorkers, as you mentioned, there's increase in gun violence this past year. Obviously, over decades, the trend has been downward in virtually all forms of crime in the city. But this spike in, in gun violence that we saw in 2020, how do you approach that differently? How do you make sure that more of those shootings, murders are, are getting prosecuted? Right. So against the backdrop of sort of everything I said about, you know, gun interdiction and uh, you know, kind of the community interrupters. Yeah, they're going to be cases we prosecute. I mean, I'm as a federal prosecutor, I prosecuted you know armed robbery, right? You know, two people go into a store with guns. Uh, you know, that causes real harm. So I've done those cases. So my commitment to to voters is people who actually do harm. Uh, well, we'll go forward with those cases. Uh, I know how to do them. I'm capable of doing them. I've stood, stood up in court, uh, and so folks can have confidence in that. I do say. We have to really think about each case individually. Um, we need to offer restorative justice options, right? Um, you know, and, and so people, if the survivor of the harm wants to engage uh, with the person who caused the harm and really get to the root issue of it, I'm going to scale that up in the DA's office. So that'll be an option. Because right now, we don't do anything for survivors of the harm. We give them a binary choice, right? Prosecute or not. That, 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 that does nothing for the survivor. So we need to scale up restorative justice so survivors can engage if they want to. Uh, but yes, I, I, I stand at the ready to prosecute uh, cases uh, where, you know, the kind I've done before, like an armed robbery of a, mine was of a grocery store that I, that's first coming to mind for me. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, a very different kind of crime. And that's what's typically referred to as white collar crime. Uh, how would you approach that as Manhattan district attorney, you know, fraud, corruption, cyber crime, money laundering, some of the, some of the categories they're in. Does the Manhattan District Attorney Office need to be more aggressive on that front? Do you think they're doing a good job as is? Would you approach it differently? What are your thoughts on, on that? Manhattan is special in so many ways, Ben. And one way is we've got Wall Street and we've got City Hall. So, you know, we need to be particularly mindful of that and, and, to, and to 
police this space. And I, I've got deep experience for 20 plus years, you know, from healthcare fraud to tax fraud to mortgage trial. Uh, I'm the person in this race who's done these cases and held uh, people accountable who've committed so-called white collar fraud. Um, I'll hold up a few examples of, of things that I did before that I want to sort of carry uh, over. Wage theft. At the Attorney General's office, we held uh, employers who cheated wages uh, out of hard-earned money, held them accountable. I'm going to do that for over a whole range of industries in the DA's office. We prosecuted landlords who were harassing tenants out of their homes. I'm going to do that in the DA's office. Uh, I also have a career of focusing on public corruption. I, I did the case that led to the conviction of former Senate Majority Leader Malcolm Smith, uh, Council Member Dan Halloran, and some others on trying to br a bribery scheme. We're going to focus on that. Uh, oversaw the case of prosecuting the mayor of uh, uh, Mount Vernon. Um, I, I have deep experience and also in procurement fraud as we have a tightening public fist. It's going to be so important that every dollar that is intended for a good public policy purpose gets there. So I prosecuted the uh, 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 someone who uh, was uh, got $16 million worth of contracts from the Department of Veterans Affairs that was set aside for a disabled veteran. He was neither disabled nor a veteran. Uh, you know, I prosecuted someone who stole more than $3 million for money that was supposed to go to putting us, our, our public school children, bridging the digital divide and wiring them up. Think about how that money could be used right now. Now you mentioned you mentioned Wall Street though early on in this answer, but I don't I don't know that I've heard anything since in terms of any examples. Are there things related to Wall Street that you think deserve more scrutiny? Definitely. So you know, at the attorney, I mean, and, and folks may be familiar with the Martin Act, which is our, our New York securities law, uh, and the Attorney General's office. We were we were used that tool uh, very well to step into gaps uh, where other regulators were not. So we had a, a case, for example, and I would do this at the DA's office where, you know, someone who was preying on elders, uh, folks who'd saved up retirement money and just, and was, and was offering them, you know, basically, hey, I can turn that $1 into a million uh, and offering them, uh, you know, basically just out and out fraud. Uh, so that's, that's, that's something, I, I mean, I was getting to it. I've, I've really done every type of uh, a white collar case you could imagine. So securities is one where we're certainly, I would say, and not just um, individual brokers, but, but we got to look at entities and, 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 and we, we've got the big banks here. We've got to be looking at, you know, I, I tried a case involving mortgage fraud of someone who was a lawyer and a former prosecutor who was using his escrow fund uh, as part of, you know, widespread mortgage fraud as part of the last financial fraud crisis. So I, I'm prepared to do all that in the DA's office. Time flies. We're in our last minute. I need both oh. these answers to be very quick. I know the first one does not lend itself to a quick answer, but from what you've seen so far, just generally speaking, do you think that Donald Trump as a private citizen should see action from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to pursue criminal charges? Give me 30 seconds on this one. Yes. So at, at the AG's office, I held Trump accountable for his misconduct with the Trump Foundation. We did the Trump University case. We sued his administration more than 100 times since this DACA Muslim travel ban. I will hold him accountable by following the facts where they go. What I've seen in the public domain is deeply troubling. This misvaluation of assets to me sounds like the basis of a, of a, of a case that could be criminal. Uh, and as you said, I need to be judicious as someone who may inherit this case. Uh, but what I can say is you look at my record of not just white collar crime generally, but specifically with Donald Trump, uh, and people can have confidence that I'm gonna go where the facts take me. And lastly, just a one name answer here. Is there a, is there a prosecutor present or past that you consider a role model? One name answer, Pre Perara. Okay. Alvin Bragg, we have to leave it there, but I appreciate the time. Thank you. Alvin Bragg is a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thanks for the time. Thank you. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters including those just in Manhattan in this district attorney race are coming up in June and the fall. There's a lot on the line for all of us in the future of our city and the borough of Manhattan. I hope this conversation was helpful. I'm Ben Max, see you next time.